fate knocking on your door. The verbal description that the famous theme of Beethoven's fifth since long received and possibly even are the master's own words, would it sound like this? Or like this? This, of course, is just a funny little exercise, certainly not rock-solid science, but probably never practically tested either. A nice starter for this video, I thought, and an eye and ear opener possibly to many, I guess, already now, whether this famous description is coming from Beethoven or not. In this video, I will try to reconstruct the options Beethoven had while writing down his fifth symphony. There is no better way to learn to understand a score than to sit down at the composer's desk. Stay tuned if you'd like to be Beethoven for a minute. So what's up everybody? My name is Wim Winters and welcome to Authentic Sound. This channel is all about exploring the music from Bach to Beethoven and beyond with a single goal to inspire you on your journey as a musician or as a music lover. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is probably the world's most well-known classical music piece. The first movement's theme is known by probably a majority of the world population of today, important enough to come up with some solid arguments for the way we mostly play the piece today. But is it possible to know what Beethoven himself had in mind? To the millimeter I'd say no, but the general outlines shouldn't be too difficult. If we today find many mysteries in his works, we should not blame Beethoven, but ourselves. I will use two opposed versions to clarify things we're going to touch upon. First, my own recording of a few days ago in a tempo based on Beethoven's own metronome number read according to the old historical use of the pendulum or metronome as a time indicator. I'll be comparing that recording to the performance that Benjamin Zander gave of the same work. Zander performs in the same metronome number as I, but read in a way the metronome was described as a musical timekeeper. Another use of the metronome, mostly applied for learning to keep time. Two completely different versions of the same piece and of the same metronome number. But if the metronome causes so much troubles today, it's essential to return to some basic principles. One of those is to reconstruct the options Beethoven had in this particular case. What are the mechanisms he used to determine upon a notation that must have been really close to what he had in mind? And can we reconstruct all of that? The answer is yes. And surprisingly, perhaps, it's not even that hard, though it's required that you understand certain basic principles. Don't panic, since some of those principles still are taught on music schools of today. You still remember your own first solfege lessons at music school? A 4-4 four, four time signature means four quarter notes in a bar with a heavy accent on one, a rather heavy accent on three, and two and four as light beats. A 2-4 the same, but a heavy accent on every first beat, meaning a faster repeat of heavy accents of the first order. Further, you still remember that a 4-4 four, four time signature is to be conducted and counted in four counts. So 1, 2, 3, 4, right? A 2-4 is counted 1-2. That is a very old practice reflected in many, if not all, historical writings such as the pianoforte schools of Hummel and Czerny and many, many others. Surprisingly, many of our problems would be solved if we'd only apply those in practice. Let's try this with the Fifth Symphony. Beethoven selected the 2-4 time signature, meaning two quarter notes to be counted in 1-2, where every beat has a quarter note heavy beat, light beat. It is important to realize that the second quarter note, notwithstanding it falls on a light beat, needs to stand on its own. It serves as the second main beat of the bar. It can never be absorbed by the first beat. 
Since then, the two quarter notes would act as two eight notes instead. Still with me here? It's not that hard. But you may ask now, what's the maximum speed for a quarter note before it turns into an eight note? Let me encourage you to try that for yourself. You'll soon experience that besides speed, also performance plays an important role. Historically, a long time agreed basic pulse, the so-called tempo ordinario, for common time, to add a difficult term in this discussion, is to give the quarter note a speed of about a second. A bit faster in case of allegro tempi, a bit slower in the direction of andantes and at the arches, of course. You can start with Hot et Terres, Treatise, L'Art de Préludie sur la Flûte Traversière, published in Paris in 1719, if you'd like to do some research yourself. That's a very practical and internationally widely spread method in which he gives you very practical information on different time signatures, their relationships and how to conduct them. In all French sources, a tempo around the second is always given for the quarter note in common time with a normal notation pattern. Quants on the German side is a little bit faster. We'll make a series of videos in the future dealing with the tempo ordinario and its speed. Returning to our symphony, it's important to see that Beethoven used a very open version of a 2-4 time signature. Compare, for instance, the symphonies 2-4 time signature to the scherzo of a sonata opus 31. In the scherzo we see the 16th note as basic fasted notes value, even on the edge of the 32nd note that still needs a strong and clear rhythmical distinct position. Harmonic changes even as fast as up to 8 notes. No such thing in the symphony. Harmonies easily go over the bar at fastest changing one time per bar. Both 2-4 time signatures, but such a different picture. It's not hard to understand that the scherzo goes in a slower pulse than the symphony. You'll read about the principle in Baroque sources as for instance C.P.E. Bach's book on keyboard playing, but even Czerny still writes on this principle in 1839 talking on Allegro. Let me summarize and translate this into English. In an Allegro, one can have notes of different length. In case you'll have 16 triplets, the tempo is to be taken somewhat slower as to not rush those notes. But when you only have simple 16th as fast as note value, one can play a bit livelier. On the condition there are no complicated harmonic progressions or polyphonic passages. In case only 8 triplets are used, the tempo again increases a bit. Again faster is the Allegro where only 8 notes are used as fast as note value. As is in our symphony the case. If we, with all this in mind, return to both performances, you probably already start to see some interesting patterns already now. Listening to Xander's performance, we may very well see in the score two quarter notes per bar, but without a score at hand, one only hears one basic pulse per bar. The first beat of the second bar serves in this case as the light beat. In other words, it takes over the function the notation gives to the previous quarter note, the second one of the first bar. Listen again. Let's continue for a moment in Zander's direction. If we take a sheet of music paper and pretend for a moment writing down a rhythmical dictation based on Zander's performance, a notation with 16 notes would represent a much closer Zander's sound result. Probably no one would come up with Beethoven's 8 note 2 4 notation. One could keep insisting that the 3rd and 4th 8 notes in Zander's tempo have their own weight in the bar, but that's absolutely not the case. There is no more than one accent per bar here given on the first 8 note. 
all three other eight notes are relative to the first accent, hence becoming dependent of that first eight note and thus bundled. A musical notation that results in four sixteenth notes and not in four eight notes. But even in my own version, the pulse still is very fast. If we really insist on giving that third eight note its accent in a normal basic pulse for common time of 60 or for the quarter note, the eight notes in my performance sound almost also a 16th note in common time. So did Beethoven make a mistake after all? I don't think so. Beethoven cleverly used the so-called a la breve notation. Choosing that notation eliminates the use of 16th notes, which simply means a doubling in tempo while at the same time halving in note value. So the 8 notes here sound as a kind of 16th notes in common time. Think again on the Czerny quote here but in reverse. The slower the fastest basic note value, the opener the harmonic progression, the higher the speed. Reason for using this doubling halving alla breve notation is to emphasize a more legato, a more cantabile, a heavier performance. Beethoven by definition here wasn't after a brisk, heavily articulated sound of performance. If that would have been his ideal, as the Zander performance takes this piece in, he made the wrong decision using this notation. So now what about that metronome number of half note 108? I soon need to make a series of videos on historical descriptions on how to use a metronome or how composers used it to indicate the desired tempo for their pieces. We will see then that often, for instance Gottfried Weber in 1813 described the metronome as giving both tact and tactile, the time and parts of the time. But how is that possible? How can a ticking device give both the time and the parts of the time? It's simple. Put your metronome in the case of a symphony of our symphony here at 108. Let it tick and it'll give you both the side mass, the tact, indicated here by the half note and the tact tile, parts of the time, the quarter note, with every tick. So that two ticks or two quarter notes give you the half note, which is for this piece the tact or the tactus, the up and down of the conductor. For the die hard doubters, very short here, in three lines, the 1816 Melzel instructions on how a composer should use a metronome. I briefly summarize here, a separate video will come soon, so these are not really my words. Three rules. First, when given time, side mass on the metronome, an allegro most often is indicated by a half note. Two, the metronome is set at a speed to give one tick every quarter note. And three, with these premises in mind, when a composer wants to have a speed of 80, the metronome must be set so that each beat falls in with the degree of quickness desired for the minimum half note or two crotchets. The instruction repeats it all in the last sentence, it being well understood that in this case, as in every other case, each single beat or tick forms a part of the intended time and is to be counted as such, but not the two beats produced by the motion one side to the other. In other words, every tick is part of the time, not the full swing. Part of the intended time, quarter notes here as part of the half note, which indeed falls together with the full swing. So this instruction, contradictory from the standpoint of today's use of the metronome, perfectly makes sense now. Here, one, Beethoven gives the half note for this allegro. Two, the metronome is set to 108, which are the quarter notes, parts of the intended time. And three, every beat or schlag gives the speed or side mass, in which case beat or schlag obviously is the full swing or full schlag, as in physics today still is used as one unity. So returning to our symphony, 
either Mr. Xander is wrong or Beethoven, you make a choice. We may even safely conclude that without the Beethoven metronome number, the conductor here would have been left without any argument whatsoever in defense of the extremely high speed in which he takes the symphony in. And as we have seen here, and will see in future videos, that reading is not the way the metronome was used to indicate tempo, speed or time. The power in Xander's version, to which many apparently are attracted to, lies in a mere rhythmical excitement generated by a certain dynamism of the heavily accentuated groups of 4-8 notes. The power of the C minor emotion, however, and the introvert dramatic story Beethoven wants to share in this musical masterpiece is buried deep under a multitude of post 19th century, perhaps even post industrial layers, we still are more prompted to than we are aware of. It might be about time to remove them, to rediscover the deep emotions those composers left us with. It may require a bit of study to do that, courage even. But my guess is that you share my idea that the music of Beethoven is worth doing it. We'll come back on the topic, that's a promise. As for now, leave your questions in the comment section below. Participate in the discussion, which by times can be lively as in previous videos, which is fine. As long as we remember one thing, we're all at the same side of the spectrum. Plus, formulating the right questions is sometimes more important and difficult than giving the right answers. That's it for now. We'll have a live stream soon reflecting on your comments and your questions. If you'd like to be part of that, hit the subscribe button and certainly also the bell icon so you'll be notified when that happens. Most probable times are Thursdays or Fridays. We'll have to set a schedule still for that. If you'd like to have more personal interaction with me, then the monthly Patreon hangouts are something for you perhaps. Link below where you can join a group of 60 patrons for Authentic Sound even from $1 a month. Best thing of it all, you support the things we do and make it possible to create more content like this. Thanks for watching this long video and see you soon again. Bye!